One, two, test. Can you hear me? Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, this session is again about color management, but from a different point of view than, uh, than the point of view that Scott Donovan showed you. My name is Marco Livato, I come from Italy. This session is called The Art of Constant Color because color management is basically uh, a technique. Actually, it's a science. You know? It's not something that we invented out of nothing. It has a background and uh, there is a strong attempt in color management to keep the colors as constant, as uniform as possible throughout the workflow, okay? But then, it's not easy, also because every reality is different. So, what I'm going to do this afternoon, this is a first basic session. It's going to last about one hour, maybe a bit less, so we have room for questions, which will probably arise. And then we have an advanced session later, uh, half past four, I think, only lasting 30 minutes, and I will try to address a very common question about calibration, which is one of the parts of color management. Okay, so let's start. Um, okay, my name is, I told you, is Marco Livotto. I'm a physicist, and my main field of action is uh, image color correction. I do mean static images, not movies. Hmm? color correction, and I'll talk about this in the next few days because there are more seminars from me coming, is image preparation. We don't deal with image preparation today. We think we have a finished artwork that we need to reproduce somehow in print since we are here, but it could as well be on the web or in a video or in a film, whatever you want, you know. Only we want to make sure that what we see on our monitors or whatever display we are using is preserved throughout and there are a few tricks that can help you obtain that okay um, my teacher is Dan Margulis he's an American guy who actually invented color correction in Photoshop and uh, my main job is teaching writing consulting and of course I do produce images as well so when we talk about color management what what do we mean in the end uh, very basic, uh, very basic definition is that color management is indeed a science, and uh, it aim, its aim is to achieve consistent color throughout a given production workflow. You know, uh, just an example. You have a photograph of a magazine, and you need to print that somehow. Let's say it's in a magazine. You know, a magazine is the old way of printing, usually. Yeah? Could be digital today, but most likely it's offset printing, you know? So, uh, it's CMYK. Hmm? This color method that no nobody uses anymore, apparently, but is still there because the colorants, the, 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 the dyes we are using, are not RGB. They are cyan, magenta, yellow, black, and more colors that we can add into the picture, you know? So, the, the real question is, uh, how do we make sure that the color of the dress we reproduce is close to what we would see in reality? Let me tell you, this is a true challenge. Don't think it's that easy, for a number of reasons. Let me just mention one. It's a phenomenon called metamerism. You probably heard about it, you know? If I take that green jacket, for instance, and look at this jacket here, I see a color which is influenced by lightning conditions uh, and the environment, basically. If I walk outside, I, it will still be a green. It's not likely to become purple, but it's going to be a different green. And this is very, very important because even paper, uh, fabric and whatever kind of uh, um, background you, you use to print on will be metameric to some extent and inks as well. So I lost my signal in the meantime, sorry. Okay. The real problem at, even before this is that it's not easy at all to describe what color is, uh, defining colors, and this is one of my favorite examples, you know? Like, imagine you have a group of kids, and you have these pencils, and you tell the kids, go pick a red pencil. Every kid will go, pick one, probably, hmm? and uh, every 
one of these pencils will be red. You cannot say to any of the kids, no, you got the wrong pencils, because they are all red. If there were green pencils and one of the kids took one, that would be a mistake. But this is an interpretation, you know? So we've just hit into one of the problems that the names we use for colors are not defining colors, but classes of colors. Hmm? So just to give you an idea, I could make a bold claim and say that the only red pencil left, I desaturated all the rest, hmm? has a formula that goes 166 in red, 33 points of green and 58 points of blue. Is this correct? And for once there is a very tiny, tidy answer, a clean answer you can give. It depends. It depends because the numbers we use change their meanings depending on which color space we choose to uh, give them a meaning as a dictionary, so to say. Hmm? So RGB is a general model, but there are several, well, potentially infinite different RGBs that we can use. Just to give you an idea of how complex it could become if we don't use color management, just think that um, any of our monitors we have on the laptop or at home are different. Not because they are calibrated differently or because they are better or worse quality. If you put uh, even similar machines close to each other, you won't see the same colors. So you can only come to the conclusion that every device, every monitor, every printer, every whatever has its own color space. You know, so it becomes very shaky what we are trying to do. And the only possible way out of this Tower of Babel, where uh, the words, the numbers actually, do mean what they want, is that we try to build some standards. All right? So, we have a few standards, but just to give you an idea, you see four seriously different red pencils, but they're all the same pencil, only the color it's an average color, of course, that I sampled, that I used as a formula, looks like the first pencil in a color space called sRGB you're probably familiar with. And then it is uh, a lot different. Uh, in particular, it's more vivid, it's more saturated if you move to Adobe RGB, which is another one of the standards. And finally, it becomes very bright and tending to pink if you go to Profoto RGB. For a change, there is a fourth version, and there are a million potential versions coming. Uh, that's the fourth pencil is how that color would look on my monitor's RGB. So, which is the right color in the end? If we don't solve this kind of problem, we can't really go forward towards consistency. So, to give a definition, what do we mean when we say sRGB, Adobe RGB, Profoto RGB? These are called color spaces. In particular, there is another name, you can find it in Photoshop, it's working spaces, okay? Because uh, a color space is just an incarnation of a color model. The color model is RGB without anything else in front of it. And you probably know what it's based upon, you know? Uh, RGB is a model that describes how colors are formed when you add together different light sources. We discovered at some point that you can build basically any kind of color, including neutrals, so white, grays, uh, blues, cyans, uh, by mixing together in different percentages uh, red, green, and blue sources of light. All right? So this is a model describing this. The problem is, how are these sources made? I mean, which kind of red, which kind of green, how bright, and a number of other things. When we decide that, we move from the model to the space. We sort of make an incarnation. It's a bit like human, you know? We're all, we all belong to the human race, but no, no one of us is identical to any other, yet we have something in common. We have two arms, two legs, one head. We function more or less the same way, you know? But we have different hair, different skin color, 
different sizes, different genders. So, you know, there is a model, but that model is very general. Then we have to focus on the particular case, all right? So, of course, in this equation, human is like RGB. And then all the single incarnations are all the devices we have that work in RGB, and they are similar but different. This is it, all right? So, when we find the color space, the color space of our monitor or whatever, it is defined and described by means of what we call a color profile. In turn, a color profile is simply a list of numbers, hmm? set of numbers, which describes a color space. All right. Now, for the sake of uh, being correct, the color space and the color profile are not identical, but in order to save <laughs> some time and remain simple, we tend to pull them together and say color space or color profile is the same, you know? Just to give an idea how different they are, okay? We are in the city of Köln in Germany. That's an entity, that's a color space. The color profile is the map of Köln, okay? It tells you how Köln is made. You, if you look at the map, you haven't, you haven't visited this beautiful city, but you sort of have an idea of how it works, how it's, uh, is there a river, and where we have the big church in the middle, and so on, you know? So it's a description. For the sake of simplicity, we'll say, okay, I've seen the map, I've been to Köln, all right? Although it's not true. Now, we need to separate things. You know what a device is? A device is a scanner, a camera, a monitor, a printer, whatever we use in our work, all right? We have device-dependent and device-independent color profiles. And let me try to explain. Whatever device you find has its own color space, it works in a certain fashion. The space is de described, as we said, by a color profile. But even identical devices can show serious difference, differences in their behaviors. Moreover, they drift in time. I'll give you an example. You go and buy two identical cars, hmm? two Maserati yeah? of a given model. You put them on the motorway and try to reach maximum speed. And then you find that the first Maserati hits 270 kilometers per hour, and the second only 268. Why? Nobody knows. The maximum speed is an average. Because if you pick another, you will be probably able to reach 262. And so you can easily say, well, we are around 260. The reason could be anything. Probably there is a small knot in the engine that has an interaction with another thing that goes and so on. And it's very difficult to track it down because this is the real world. The numbers are digital, but reality is not digital at all. I mean, I am analog. For God's sake, everything is, even a monitor, all right? So there is a drift over time, usage, decay, and so on. So when we profile this device, we are actually profiling something that changes over time. And the, the, prof the color profile of any device is not written in stone because it changes over time, and it is, as I like to say, volatile, you know? So. A device-dependent color profile is very, very useful because it describes my hardware, but in some cases, it has no meaning at all. Let, let me give you an example. This lady takes a profile of a monitor. A profile is something that you usually put inside an image. When you save in Photoshop, say, you say, include color profile, and she goes, OK, and gives me the file. So I have her monitor's profile which is surely very nice, very interesting, but it has nothing to do with my monitor. It is correct in a way, uh, but you know, I am simply taking into account that that kind of file was done in a certain way, but that's no standard, because her monitor is absolutely individual, as we all are, you know? So, we need some kind of standard, so that when I get the file to my printer, and the printer goes to, uh, 
someone and says, can you change this or that in the file? We know exactly what kind of language we are talking, we are speaking, you know? So at that point, enter device-independent color profiles. These are very particular, are very special color profiles because they do not describe any real device. Um, they come from mathematical models, okay? And because of this, they are very useful as standards. Let me give you an example because you probably heard it, you know? You all have a smartphone, probably. If you go on the web or read uh, in the magazines, they will tell you this smartphone is sRGB. Not true. It can't absolutely be. Because sRGB is device independent. It was generated by a computer, like imagine you have this red, this green, this blue, this white point, and this gamma, which means contrast in the end. Move the machine, spit out numbers. This is sRGB. But this has nothing to do with my iPhone or his iPhone or anything. What this statement means is that the actual behavior of this device is rather close to the ideal that sRGB is. All right? Another example. You buy a very expensive monitor, Azo. You have 99% coverage of Adobe RGB. This seems to mean the same. Well, OK, there is a tiny slice of greens that the monitor can't reproduce, but they are in this independent, sorry, independent color profile Adobe RGB. But on the other side, the monitor is larger than Adobe RGB. So it's not a simple relationship, you know? Just remember that there is something that describes your device, device-dependent color profile. That's what you actually take with your colorimeter, and I'll show you how later. But we are dealing with models, ideal models for standardization, hmm? which is very good because uh, if uh, the same file as before doesn't come with a monitor profile attached, but with, say, sRGB or Adobe RGB or Profoto RGB, that are the three main color spaces in use today, when I open the file, I say, OK, that's Adobe RGB. I know this beast. I know how it is. Keep on speaking the same language, so to say, that is written in the files, and I'm happy, you know? As I told you, my monitor is sRGB. It's not correct. It can be a good approximation, eh? but it's a completely different uh, idea. Hmm? So let me show you in practice. Um, the three spaces listed here, sRGB, Adobe RGB, Profoto RGB, are called working spaces. There would be a lot more theoretical models like Apple RGB, Color Match RGB, you, the list is endless, really. But these three actually are the ones we use. Hmm? It was a very bloody battle between color profiles, and then these three emerged, and they have different characters. Anyway, in Photoshop, you should use uh, any kind of working space, but most likely one of these three as your default RGB profile. There is a small problem that I'm telling you about, that Adobe, when you buy Photoshop, has a completely different setup. It has your monitor's profile as default, which is possibly the wrongest choice you can make. So the first thing you should do is really change these settings in Photoshop. I can show you how to do it. It's just one click. But remember, the Photoshop is shipped in the wrong way. Why? Don't ask me. I don't know. But it's been like this for 20 years. <laughs> it would be just about time to change it. Because uh, I can show you nasty effects of those settings. And they are indeed very nasty. OK? Anyway, this thing I wrote in red, you should use a working space as your default profile. 
is always true, except for maybe in one case out of 1,000, very, very special case. There is a school of thought that tries to say, this is not true, you should use your monitor profile. Please, <laughs> beg you, don't believe it. It can really lead to problems and is an inferior solution anyway, so why taking it in the end? So, we get to the very fundamental uh, problem that is game it. Hmm? Uh, have you ever heard of this word? Do you know where it comes from? That's completely nothing to do with color. It's Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare in one of the comedies. Uh, there is, I can't remember which kind of character, who is trying to play a melody on the lute. And he, and he, he talks about the game of the notes needed to build a melody. So you see, it's an extension of things, different objects that put together something bigger. And it was translated into color for that reason. Okay? But to understand game it, which is not most easily understood thing, you must think that color spaces can be compared to each other. Hmm? Like I said, I, a sphere can be compared to a cube. Is it bigger? Is it larger? Which shape it is, you know? Like I would, could take this seat and take another smaller one and conclude that this is bigger. And I could say, if I could put the big one inside, it would be completely contained. So I can make comparisons. And this is it. We can choose a given reference so that we know that we are talking about, and then we can check how this sort of sphere relates to it, you know? When we put a color space into the reference space, which I'll show you in a second, we have a footprint. Like, you know, it's that big, it has that shape. And that's a game, you know? So, let me introduce to you the cube. This is the reference color space. And it's not RGB, it's not CMYK, it's, uh, well, it's, there is another one that is used very often, but this is very common and very easy to understand. This is called LAB, you know, and uh, it has a number of interesting characters that I'll discuss on my last day here, that is on Thursday, but for now, we only need to know that this is, this is the colored container which is used as a reference to map the gamuts of the other color spaces. In practice, it means this. In the same scale as the previous slide, this is the shape, it's not a sphere, I'm sorry, it's a piece of cheese of some kind, but this is sRGB. Do you know now what it means that it has a smaller gamut? If you think of uh, the gamut as a, a painter's palette, this painter has a palette this big, uh, and it has a lot of colors in it, but if we cut the palette, only a small part will remain, and the other colors will be inexistent. In our world, in our language, they cannot be reproduced in the smaller color space. They simply are not there, okay? So, this is the game mode of sRGB, which is the smallest of the three color spaces I mentioned in relationship to LAB, okay? If you want to see it embedded into LAB, this is how it works, you know? So, any color you can define in sRGB is contained in this kind of colored sponge, you know? But there are a lot of colors that we can see that lay outside, and sRGB doesn't hold. Imagine that as a dictionary, you know? This is a dictionary, of, a, a dictionary for tourists. Very few basic words to survive, but you can't discuss philosophy with this, all right? You can say bread, you can say water, you can say sleep. Basic words, but nothing... Mm. Now, let's move forward. I've changed now the scale. This is uh, represented bigger. The gamut, in the same sense of sRGB, of this new space called Adobe RGB, which, as you see, is a bit larger. Yeah? 
please pay attention to these slides now and see what happens when I go back to representing sRGB in the same scale. Okay? Do you notice how many greens are missing? Adobe RGB, not only greens, but that's the most striking thing. Adobe RGB is a lot more extended in the greens than sRGB. Okay? And anyway, if you want to compare the two, here you have a picture. You might wonder, is Adobe RGB as big as LAB? Absolutely not. It's still contained in the largest color space. We chose LAB also because we need a, a, a big container enough for all colors, substantially. But this is the relationship with, between the two gamuts of the large, large large-ish, uh, Adobe RGB and the small uh, sRGB. Um, of the three ones that I mentioned, that is sRGB, Adobe RGB and Profoto RGB, which is the relationship between them? Just to give you a rough idea, this is the gamut of sRGB. Adobe RGB is like this. Profoto is more or less like this. It's a weird space because it's bigger than LAB in some parts. So we need another way to describe it, but that's not important right now. So uh, one of the things would be, OK, that's fantastic. I love color. I want to have as many as possible. And therefore, why not using the biggest choice we have? We can stick to Profoto RGB, which basically means that we are going to paint, you know? Ah, images with the largest possible palette. Good idea. Hitting the rock bottom of reality first. There is no monitor on Earth, and there will never be one, that is capable of reproducing all the gamut of Profoto RGB. Printers, even worse. So, it's a good idea in principle, and it's valuable if you know what you're doing. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's like giving someone the aforementioned Maserati and say, oh, please, have a test drive. I said, I just got my license. Well, have a test drive. You jump on the Maserati, go crash. This is what may happen with Profoto if you're not very proficient at manipulating color. Because it's nice to have a Ferrari, but you usually don't go to the shop with a Ferrari, you know? It's not, it, 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 there are cases where you can do with less, which is not in any way saying that Profoto is a bad color space. It's only very big. Big means powerful. Power calls for responsibility while using it, you know? And so, The question is, how do you build a profile? Well, of course, you don't need to build a device-independent profile. You just pick the one you want to use. I saw RGB, Adobe RGB, the likes. But you need to make a profile for your device, for your devices. And here is where I connect with what Scott uh, told you in the, in the previous section, the session. session sorry. Uh, there are basically two kinds of devices. One is called a colorimeter, and one is called a, a, a spectrophotometer. They accomplish the same task in different ways. Basically, a colorimeter is able to measure the intensity and the color of a light source. So, you simply take a colorimeter, stick it to your monitor, and ask it, uh, what, what color am I seeing? What luminosity am I measuring? Hmm? And you will get a number. A spectrophotometer can do the same, but does something that a um, colorimeter can't do. That is, it could measure the lightness and the color of this thing, which is not a light source, because this reflects light. You know, that's different. So, colorimeter for monitors, spectrophotometers for prints. This is the basic equation. The workflow you have to follow is 
that you need to choose uh, the calibration parameters. And I'll be talking about this in the next session, hmm? not this one. You then need to characterize the device, which is go through a series of measurements, uh, the famous color samplers that Scott before was saying, I measure 1,500 of them, and then throw them into a software, and then an ICC profile comes out. And then finally, you have to build, well, you don't have to build anything, the software will do it for you, and install the color profile inside the computer, okay? It's absolutely important that when you profile your monitor, which is usually the first step, the color profile that comes out must be installed at operating system level, which means be on a Mac, be on Windows, be on Linux, doesn't change. There is some place inside the operating system where this profile is going to be installed. You don't have to worry too much about that because the software will take care of that for you, 99% of the time at least, okay? But do not use that profile in Photoshop as the default profile because it goes against the rule that we need a working space as a default profile because that's dangerous, okay? I don't want to sound threatening, but unfortunately, this is very, very little understood. You have no idea how many professionals I find that have the wrong color settings, you know? And I'm not at all optimistic about it, simply because uh, there is a setting by Adobe, nobody cares to change it. Hmm? And then, when you open a file, the original color profile is forgotten, the monitor profile is assigned, and that's the end of color management. Hmm? It's, uh, color management is difficult, not in itself, but because it's a chain made of different uh, pieces, you know? And if somebody does the wrong thing, the chain goes like, and is broken. So it only works if everyone involved in the workflow is uh, doing the right thing. If you're a photographer printing your own photographs in your own lab, then you have little problem. The seriously dangerous thing is when your precious photograph goes out to a printer or anyone for manipulation of some kind and the chain gets broken because someone is not quite acquainted with what should be done. And uh, before getting to the end, I want to show you in practice one thing that I'm telling you. Like, uh, if you go in Photoshop, any version, any recent version of Photoshop, go on the edit menu, and you have this interesting uh, entry called color settings, you know? When you hit it, you get a complex window like this. I'll, I'll show you how Adobe ships the whole thing. Notice that I turned my version to English for this fair, but I use Photoshop in Italian. Italy is, for a while at least, still in Europe. And we don't have US web coded standard for CMYK. This already should tell you this is wrong, but the most, the worst thing is here and here. Color management policies off, off, off. If you want to have a laugh, I'll, I'll show you what can happen. You have one minute. All right. I'll just hit OK and confirm this. And let me open a file that I should have. OK. OK. This is a the entrance of a big amusement park, uh, park for children in northern Italy, you know, so a bit like a small Disneyland, you know? So very bright colors, very vivid stuff. And you see, I am all set up in Camera Raw, which is this development module for raw image, to use Profoto RGB, all right? And I will say open image, remember that I changed my settings, 
and I get a nasty warning, which you've probably seen before. I won't spend 10 minutes discussing this, but I think that you can all agree that if you don't know anything about color management, uh, this is Greek. You don't know what to do. Because you really have no idea what is an embedded color profile that does not match the color working space. Um, and you are offered a series of options. What would you like to do? Assuming you don't know, you will trust Adobe's authority because it's the flagship program from the biggest uh, uh, software uh, manufacturer in this field. And Adobe's suggestion is that you discard the embedded profile and don't color manage, which means uh, make this file forget what language he is speaking, the numbers stop having any sensible meaning. Do you remember the colors we had? See what happens. Do you think it looks like before? I'll show you. Let me open it again in uh, camera row. This is what you expected. And this is what you have. And there's no warning, basically. Moreover, if I save this, it will get saved without a profile. And if you have the same settings that I have, when you receive my file, it will open it, giving you different colors because you are actually assigning the dictionary of your monitor, which is different than mine, without a warning. So let's see now what happens. Let me close this abomination. If I go back to any, and I do mean any other setting. Some, somebody, so, sometimes people say, uh, they ask me, what, what's the best setting in Photoshop? Anyone, not that, <laughs> not the default. Any other thing is better. OK, let me quickly open this thing again. Look at the color. Same window, but with a different option. Preserved color. It's not that difficult. Just change the defaults in Photoshop. Is this clear, the reason why we are doing that? Yeah? In the most extreme case, if you had a monitor which is black and white, this image would open in black and white, would lose the color completely, simply because that profile of the monitor is uh, assigned, you know. So you are trying to, you are trying to read words written for a certain language that have no meaning at all in, in another language, but still you are trying to, uh, to make them work, and it doesn't work, of course. All right? So, Okay, this is more or less the, the whole of it for now, but I'm sure there could be some questions, so I'm available if you want.